Stefan Molyneux is a blogger, essayist, author, and host of uh, Free Domain Radio. Series of podcasts. He's written numerous articles and essays which have been published at Libertarian, LewRockwell.com, AnnieWar.com, and he's done over 1,800 podcasts, self-published, uh, and uh, he's coming out with a bunch of books as well. So he joins us today. As promised, I wanted to get him back. Time flies via video Skype. And there's so much to discuss, but I'm, well, in a few minutes, I want to play the uh, WNBC, uh, no, the NBC uh, piece uh, with Geithner uh, over the weekend where he came out. In fact, I'm looking for the exact quote here. Uh, Geithner on Meet the Press and said, for a lot of people, it's going to feel very hard, harder than anything they've experienced in their lifetime now for a long time to come. So he says, this is the worst thing in our lifetime. This recovery is so good, Stefan. And if you say this engineered global depression is not a wonderful recovery, you are a conspiracy theorist, Stefan. That's uh, very sad, but true, Alex. It's good to have an extremist on with us. Uh, what do you make <laughs> of... Uh, the fireworks going on in the economy, the police state, uh, all the bizarre behavior. I mean, it, the ruling class is going insane. Well, you know what it is, Alex? I mean, my training is in history, and it's like a grim rewind to the last days of the Roman Empire. You could slap togas on these guys, and it would be pretty much a frame-to-frame -frame repeat where you get the imperial presidency, you get the continual withering of Congress into a sclerotic kind of money-grubbing, taxpayer-raping kind of institution. So this growth of charisma, this growth of dictatorial powers, uh, this stepping over any last remnants and shreds of of constitutional legality is all been played out before and I hope I hope I hope we learn enough from this phase in history that it's just not gonna happen again we can hope 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 for the best that way well that's what's horrifying anybody that's ever cracked a history book knows that excesses by corrupt elites using government power are legion and that liberty is the rare jewel that must be defended as Thomas Jefferson said I don't think the general public realizes that governments always go to complete excess and turn our wonderful lives into living nightmares. Well, and another thing that's interesting, uh, what you can see going on in Europe is a very fascinating thing, which we talked about the last time I was on, that when government is at some point restrained or controlled or minimized, all it does is it opens up the free market, the free market generates wealth. The government then uses that excess wealth as collateral to borrow more. And so you can see the Irish tiger of the 90s has now become one of the biggest debt-ridden countries in the EU. Portugal has had a 10-year very successful end of the war on drugs. You think that would give them lots of extra money? No, they're also going down. Moody has just downgraded Portugal's banks to junk status because we have a war going on between the U.S. dollar and the euro about which one is going to... It's like watching King Kong and Tyrannosaurus Rex go at each other uh, with chainsaws. It's which one is going to fall first, so there's a few extra dollars It left is like Mothra that and Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Except the special effects are even cheesier and the subtitles are even worse. But yeah. Oh, wait a minute, wait on. a minute. You know that Bin Laden thing was real. Uh, I mean, there's no lies here. And you can see, of course, uh, what happened when they're shipping drugs to, uh, sorry, they're shipping uh, weapons uh, to, to Mexican drug lords. Yet again, we have another example of the people who are supposed to protect us arming our enemies, just as they did with the Mujahideen in the 80s, and just as they did by giving lots of money and, and, and aid to the Soviets during the communist Saddam, era. Saddam, uh, look, they're using Al-Qaeda against Gaddafi right now. Right, Qaddafi, and one of the reasons Qaddafi was invaded was he's sitting on one of the largest gold stores in the United in the world, uh, unlike the rest of the countries which seem to be conveniently ignored. Uh, if you look at the economic drivers of this current economic collapse, one of the reasons, of course, is that the baby boomers are about to retire, so they have to kill the system because there's simply no money there, so they have to create this emergency in order to get people to accept reduced circumstances. They have to create these wars to create these artificial emergencies and unity. They have to... Uh, uh, fight against other currencies that are gaining ascendancy in the general fear that the euro or some other currency is going to become the de facto trading currency for oil. If you just peel away the surface layers, it's all about control of fiat currency, control of the population. And uh, of course, it's our hope as, as thinkers and communicators that we can give people this red pill and have them wake up no matter how startling it might be. Let me ask your opinion or your uh, educated view on this. I, I didn't know this, but it's been linked on Drudge all day, uh, drudgereport.com, down in the middle of the article. They had the latest video of the six-year-old boy being groped once and crying, so they double-grope him. 
to, to you know to really teach him as he's crying. I think my children would cry if this was happening. I mean, they they don't like strangers. I mean, I mean, I mean that's a normal instinct. But TSA lied to lawmakers, still conducting pat downs. Why did they say in November and again in April that they're not doing pat downs? And they said they'd stop doing them. Then they told Congress a month ago that it had stopped and it's intensifying. I've witnessed it flying recently. What is this tactic of lying? Is it just to set the precedent that they're going to lie in plain view and they don't care? Yeah, I mean, there's that old joke, how do you know a politician is lying? There's a microphone around. Uh, and uh, that is uh, the way it goes, that these people are sociopaths. They're pathological. Uh, there was a study that was done recently, and it's sort of not funny, though it is funny in a way, which said that uh, serial killers uh, have similar characteristics psychologically to politicians, with the exception that we don't give serial killers uh, aircraft carriers, nuclear weapons, and endless prison systems to incarcerate their victims. Well, that's serial actually what's taught, limited. as you know, in, in high-level criminology, um, that... Actually, they, they, they call them what high functioning psychopaths uh, tend to actually get into government. They're, they don't start killing and stuff until they get that immunity and that power. And that's why the Stalins, the Hitlers, the Maos are the norm in history. And a Thomas Jefferson is the exception. Right. And so one of the characteristics of sociopaths is that they're consistently lying. The second is that they look for whatever weak spot you have and will exploit it for their own gain. And one of the things that's very true of the West, and I think this is very true of Americans, Americans are very, very generous people. They, they give a lot to charity. They really want to help the poor. And so the sociopaths in power say, ah, you care about the poor, do you? Well, we'll take care of the poor. And then they just raise the taxes. Oh, you care about the sick. <laughs> we'll oh, take care let's of raise the taxes yes. so we can take care of the sick. Oh, you want the poor children to be educated? Bwahaha. Let's raise the taxes so we can educate the poor. And people fall for this without realizing that these things are just a pretext for increased theft and control. And we'll the give them shots so they don't get sick, filled with cancer viruses. <laughs> Yeah, they, oh, they, they, I, I miss the politicians that had those little pencil-thin mustaches that they could roll, you know, the blah, the, the sort of evil oh. laugh. But, um, <laughs> there was a, a sort of funny joke in, in America, sorry, in England recently, the, one of the uh, dictators from the Middle East came to visit England and they wanted to protest, the, the marching band wanted to protest, so they, paid, they played the Emperor's theme from uh, Star Wars, you know, bam, 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 bam. I really feel that that should be played every time a politician walks into the room. Uh, they don't have to wear the black helmet and sound like they've got asthma but i think that would really help clarify the <laughs> position of power they have over us and they should have stormtroopers on either side just so the kids understand what uh, what sort of society they live in we'll be right back ladies and gentlemen don't act so surprised your highness you weren't on any mercy mission this time several transmissions were sent to this ship i want to know what happened to the plans they sent you you are part of Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. Join me and I will complete your training. The Emperor has foreseen this. Give yourself to the New World Order. Hand in your firearms. Submit to carbon taxes for the children and the bumblebees. Going back to Stefan Molyneux, that's enough from Sith Lord Darth Vader. Uh, Mr. Molyneux, this is a short segment. There's so much going on in the world. What is uh, front and center on your radar screen? Well, I'm really, really quite interested in the way that the American credit rating agencies have downgraded Portugal's debt and seem to be on the verge of downgrading Italy's debt. Greece was fairly small. It's a very small part of the EU, but uh, depending on how you measure it, Italy is between three and uh, the third and fourth biggest um, uh, one on the size economy in the EU. So I think that they're really doing an attack on the euro at the moment to cover up the fact that the dollar is taking such a big dive relative to the euro. So, for instance, the rating agencies in America have said that they're going to look at any voluntary rollovers of the Greek debt, you know, just sort of keep buying more and more as a kind of default. Yet the fact that the Fed has bought a staggering amount of American debt is not considered a default. America has already defaulted on its debt because it's buying its own treasuries. And so I think Stay that's on the leader. I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. I think that's going to be, I think he's playing a video game while I'm talking, but that's okay. I can talk to the listeners. But no, I, I think that's really, really quite fascinating to see these two giant beast dying currencies hacking away at each other rather than trying to deal with their own problems. Mathematically, the euro can't survive. Mathematically, the dollar can't survive. I don't know that there's much will to try and centralize these things into a larger central bank. I think that that's all kind of exhausted. So it is going to be quite fascinating. I think if we see 
a collapse of the euro. We might see a breakup of Europe into its more individual currencies, which might stave things off for a little longer. But, you know, I think people just really recognize deep down that the system as a whole, I mean, I think it's already dead. I think it's just doing that after death body. I agree. And they on. sell us a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you look at the Rockefeller Foundation over 100 years ago, now 111 years ago, they would fund the National Council of Churches to actually teach the end of the world's coming don't get involved, you know, do whatever you're told. And now they have 2012 for the non-Christians to think the world's ending so that people just have a foregone conclusion. No, it's the opposite. These elites are pathetic. They can be defeated. They can be defeated. And to me, the fundamental argument is just waking people up to the violence in the system, to the fact that fiat currency is based on violence. It is based upon a legal and, and moral attack upon any competing currencies. Gold-based currencies are, are robbed and, and threatened uh, throughout the world. Uh, taxes is based on, on threats and violence. The war on drugs is based on uh, threats and violence. The education of miseducation, indoctrination of the young Fear is based will on keep the local violence. systems in line. Fear of this aircraft carrier. But that's impossible. <laughs> Who will maintain control without the bureaucracy? Right. Yeah, there's this weird thing that because the government has a monopoly on something like educating the young, if you take the government out of the equation, somehow the young won't be educated. It's like saying if you take a huge rock out of the middle of a river, that the river is still going to go around the hole rather than fill it in. And that's this weird thing. Because the government does it, if the government doesn't do it, it won't be done. Like there's no history where it was ever done before without the government. Roads were built without the government. The literacy rate prior to government education was far higher than it is now. Now we have this ridiculous spectacle of teachers cheating on tests in order to get bonuses. I mean, it's just sad and pitiful. The same thing which children get thrown out of school for, parents, uh, sorry, uh, teachers are getting rewarded for. And this is happening so far throughout the system, there's nothing in the system that is working anymore except propaganda, which is always needed when a system doesn't work. And I just hope that the evidence is accumulating to the point where even the worst addict to state violence is waking up and saying, maybe this stuff doesn't work anymore. That's my particular hope. But of course, addicts are the last ones sometimes to see the basic truth. Well, that's the other big issue is they keep drugs illegal so the big mega banks can make bigger profits. When something's a black market, it's more expensive. And, and I've even heard talk show hosts that are pro-drug war now coming out and admitting the government deals the drugs and that the drug war is a fraud. And so this, what do you think the system's going to do to try to stop this revolution of awakening? Well, what they're going to do is they're going to, as they're already doing, they're going to arm more of the drug lords, right? So they, they, lots of government weapons are going to find their way into the drug lords' hands. There's, they're going to fund the crackdowns in Mexico and other places. And so this is to fight the example in Portugal, where 10 years of legalized drug use, or at least decriminalized drug use, has resulted in far lower drug addictions, far better treatment for the sick people who are addicted to drugs. And lower so crime. What they're going to do, yeah, they're going to lower crime, they're going to arm the enemies, and so the enemies uh, then create all of this violence and then they say, aha, you see, you need us. It's like the doctor who injects you with a poison and then says, I'm the only one with a cure. And that's all that they do over and over again. Well, Stefan Molyneux is our guest. He's an extremist. He believes two plus two equals four. I've never had such conspiracy theorizing on my show. Your call is straight about uh, your website and how people uh, can visit that. Sure, it's at freedomainradio.com. Uh, it is the biggest philosophy conversation in history, but of course that's mostly just because of the new technology. And yeah, we've had like almost 35 million downloads and video views and uh, 10,000 board members. And so it's a really thriving community of people very interested in philosophy. So I hope to check it out. I got tons of free books up there. I just released one called uh, The Handbook of Human Ownership, a manual for new tax farmers, which is a tongue-in-cheek, humorous instruction manual for new politicians on how to rule the herd. So yeah, I yeah briefly break down uh, 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 the tax farmer system for folks that aren't familiar with that. Sure. Well, you know, you look at a map of the world and you see these geographical regions in different colors with labels. And a lot of people think that it's about culture and a lot of people think it's about nationalism. But the reality is that all of the countries that you see on a map are actually just tax farms. And they are very modern tax farms where we are no longer assigned to our occupations like serfs. We're no longer owned directly like slaves. We're no longer eaten directly like the old style cannibalism of the Stone Age. Now we're allowed to choose our own occupations, which makes us more productive, which means that we can generate more money and wealth for our owners. 
The problem is, of course, that uh, democracy can't work without massive bribery of the population. It's as true now as it was in ancient Greece, as it was in ancient Rome. And that creates the collectivism and then destroys the human species, turning us into lazy, servile blobs. Well, I hope that we're not going to get to a destruction of the human species. It certainly does destroy the economy in the long run. I mean, you, you can't have a democracy without debt because you have to bribe people, right? So the baby boomers who got 3 to $4 in services for every dollar they paid in taxes thought it was the best system ever. Look at this. We've got all this uh, free health care and we've got all this free stuff and it's wonderful and it's great. The problem is, of course, as Margaret Thatcher famously said, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money to burn. Well, it's and two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. What what happens after the wolves have eaten all the sheep and eaten the sheep a uh, herder? You know, that's my issue for you. I see at the Bilderberg Group and things, a lot of big libertarians like the head of the PayPal Mafia <coughs> and others, you know, these multi-billionaires, they're pushing libertarian ph philosophy. But in the end game, now that through crony non-free market systems, they've consolidated control, now they're pushing austerity and cutting off resources. Uh, now the people are dependent as libertarian or you know oh, yeah. uh, uh, anarchic capitalism but then they're always scapegoating the, the the unfeasibility of the ongoing welfare state ignoring the banker bailouts ignoring uh, the fiat money system that was designed to be impossible to pay back and convert us from the greatest creditor nation to the greatest debtor nation the same for the, you know, every other nation so 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 i mean certainly you've seen in the whole globalist hive borg they're now putting some libertarian camouflage uh, on top their backs uh, a bit. Well, I'll tell you, Alex, you know the system is about to crash when libertarians are invited to run the show. Because that way, when the whole thing goes up in flames, everybody will remember, hey, who was in charge when it all crashed? Those crazy libertarians. And they'll just discredit freedom for another thousand years. So my strong, strong advice is, hey, you know, support Ron Paul if you think he's a good educator, and I think he is. But for heaven's sakes, libertarians and anarchists do not go near anywhere this Titanic because it already hit the iceberg and you do not want to be anywhere near political power when the giant sucking sound of imploding fiat currencies and collapse economies is heard around the world, you want to make sure that all of the idiots who made this mess are in charge when it goes down. So I know there's a great temptation to get in there and try and fix it. It's way too late. It was too late with the great society. That, that's sealed the doom of the Western democracies. So stay away from political power because don't be anywhere near the well, helm of this ship when it goes down. Sure. I mean, I mean, even if you would be against tariffs, it's not you know, when another country has high tariffs on you, you raise yours. That actually creates you know a level playing field. So so tariffs, when the other has tariffs, is actually free market at a limited level. You know, things are sophisticated. They're not just, you know, black and white. There's a lot of gray there. Uh, but I am for no tariffs if the other people were actually, you know, doing it. The problem is they are tax farms basically trying to cheat uh, the other tax farms. But Ron Paul has said now is the time for him to try to get in because it is imploding. He can go in and point out what they did. If not, they may use the implosion to sell more collectivism. But I do see your point about they could then scapegoat us like they did smooth haulings. The economy was already in a depression. They got in, put tariffs in. They then blamed the depression on that when it had been the collectivist engineering uh, the whole situation from the beginning. Let's play a clip uh, from uh, NBC's Meet the Press with Tiny Tim uh, Geithner, uh, the guy who told the Chinese they're not devaluing the dollar, and they laughed at him a few years ago um, because they were informed, unlike certain people uh, here in the United States. Uh, and uh, let's play this clip where he says, the worst stuff of our lifetime's coming. It's going to be painful, and it's going to last for a long time. Here it is. Treasury, Tim Geithner, Mr. Secretary, welcome back. Nice to see you, David. What happened? Well, this is hard. You know, it's politically very hard, but this is a grave moment for the country. We need to do something very big, very substantial to bring our long-term deficits down over time. We have to do that in a way that's good for the economy, so we give more support to this economy still healing from the Great Recession. Oh. And it's going to require both sides to compromise. The president's bringing the leaders together again at the White House this evening to try to figure out how, how to move forward. Oh, so yeah. what does he actually say, though? Because it, you're hearing two different things. You hear Boehner saying, look, uh, they're demanding tax increases. We're not going to do that. Uh, they've also said that you were backpedaling a bit on whether you'd cut entitlement programs like Medicare or Social Security. That, what's, that latter, what's the fact? That latter thing is not true. The president is standing tough. He is willing to do very, very difficult political things. Like what? Like on Medicare. getting very substantial savings from the budget, across the budget, 
defense, the rest of government, even Medicare, Medicaid over the long term, there are things we can do responsibly to save money in those programs, and we have to do that if we're going to bring these deficits under control. But to do that, we have to have some shared sacrifice. We have to find a way to avoid shifting more of the burden of the tax system to the middle class. It's going to take a balanced approach. Both sides are going to have to make some compromises. And, and you know, just one thing to Republicans, we know this is very hard to do, but they should not walk away now from trying to do something good for the country. This is very important for the country now, for the economy to be growing long term, restore confidence that Washington can actually do things that solve some problems. You need both sides to come together. Now. What was the president's reaction to Boehner's move? Well, you know, the president wants to do the right thing for the country, and he recognizes that to do the right thing, you have to try and do the biggest, most substantial deal possible. The deal is going to be best for the economony. And, you know, his view is... All right, hit pause. He's going to bring people together. And we're oh, we had a miscommunication. I thought it was queued up to this quote. I know that's a long interview. Just see if you can, by the end of the show, find the place where he says, quote, meet the press. That is a very tough economy, he says, that a lot of people... It's going to feel very, very hard, harder than anything they've experienced in their lifetime now for a long time to come. But, but I mean, just that first part, I'm glad that we didn't have it queued up uh, uh, to where I wanted because that was even worse. We're, they're now calling it the Great Recession. They're admitting it never ended. Uh, so now it's not Great Depression, it's Great Recession. We're three years in to having three quarters in a row uh, of non-growth, even with Cook numbers. I mean, and, and here they are telling us massive taxes on poor and middle class to pay the bankers who've written the tax laws where they're almost completely exempt, uh, that that's going to fix things. I mean, these guys are something else, Stefan. And who, who is taking a shred of responsibility for the complete failure of TARP and the stimulus package and all of the money that was blown and burnt and sent into the stratosphere to supposedly deal with this crisis? Now, it's like nothing ever happened that they had this huge plan that was supposed to rescue us from the recession. Now they're admitting there was a recession anyway, but we're much more in debt. Than and now they want to rape us again and rape us again. It's the same thing in Greece over and over again, and it's just never going to end. And they, they, you know what the, the dangerous thing is? And don't you just hate being right all the time? Oh, I wish I would be wrong. I because agree. you make these terrible predictions and you just want to be wrong. Because they're starting to use the word sacrifice. I predicted this about a year ago, that there was going to be no recovery. And when there was no recovery and things began to get worse and worse and the debt ceiling was going to be bumped up against and the entitlement programs were under threat, what they were going to start talking about, Alex, was the need for shared sacrifice. Yeah, and now, now they've course, introduced guys, a bill where we voluntarily have money taken out of our check and the inside baseball is once they totally default they're just going to use that here's an example my dad was going to sign up to pay online taxes to the private federal reserve to the irs uh, with wells fargo and it turned out it was a goldman sachs waiver in fact it's out in my car and the whole thing you waive your rights they're now a tax reporter you, you you allow them to take all the money out of your account and give it to the government it's a contract where you waive all your rights in the future and allow them to share all your data when you get a cloud computing thing with amazon they waive your rights and say they now own your data i mean these people are out of control i'm sorry go ahead no, they, they're completely out of control. And now they're going to start talking about sacrifice. And sacrifice is political ease for bend over, grab your shoelaces. This ain't going to be pretty. Because well, take Lord Rothschild. That. He's got giant $300 million yachts, jet airplanes. He rented a whole giant uh, island for his party for 300 people. World leaders went there. Taxpayer paid for security. They would come across the water, grab cameras from mainstream media, erase them. And he literally is then giving speeches about not being able to take a hot bath or have a, a, a heating in the winter because it's hurting the earth with carbon while the i mean it is such a sick joke yeah i really i have a tough time understanding how people take this at all uh, seriously but now this this talk of sacrifice when the ruling classes are backed into a corner and all of their disastrous uses of violence and deception have caught up with them then they start talking about shared sacrifice and shared sacrifice means you all better get used to a pretty damn low standard of living because the whole system is coming down and we're going to grab as much gold and treasure as we can and you're going to be left with uh, you know uh, tang uh, as your meals and that is what is going to happen oh hey uh, when i go to whole foods now for three years it's all how sexy austerity is and how it's good to be in a depression and and and, and all the trendies are like oh yeah we're imploding it's so fun oh. so they're now making it fun to be a poor slave 
Yeah, they're absolutely doing that kind of stuff, and it's, it's completely wretched, and we need to push back on the idea of, of sacrifice. This is not how the West was built. The West was not built on let's accept lower and less and, and more poverty and, and less access to information and less uh, of a high standard of living. That had nothing to do with how the West was built. The West was built on life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, property rights, and freedom, and a growth in the economy that was continual so that we could deal with things like environmental problems by, uh, by wealth, not through poverty. You know, to solve environmental problems, you need an excess of wealth so that you can install, install scrubbers, so that you can have more localized production of energy. You don't want a poverty-based reduction in your That's right. Wealth living. makes things cleaner. Wealth, yes. on record, makes you have less children. And, and instead, they've blocked development, making it filthy squalor. Yes, and they're going to call this sacrifice. And what they're going to do is they're going to try and make a virtue out of surrendering the last vestiges of your middle class lifestyle and say it's for the planet it's for the children it's for the future it's for the spotted owl it's for the fish in the sea it's for every this has nothing to do with it the, the only way to solve environmental depredation is through the privatization oh and here's another thing while i'm on that topic of privatization you're also going to see a massive privatization of government which is another form of tax increase because what happens is they privatize let's say they privatize the parks well before you didn't have to pay much to get into the parks because it was absorbed in your taxes now when they privatize the parks you're going to have to pay a lot more to uh, to go into the park it's just another form of raising your taxes so they're going to sell stuff off and they're going to take the profits for themselves and then you're going to have to pay the private company well it's and not real privatization private either because it's all done inside deals that's right, yeah, just as it was in Russia. And, oh, okay, last thing, so I'm in a good rant fest here. The banks have now recently been threatened with, uh, you have to pay $30 billion and we're going to wipe out any problems you had with your fraudulent mortgages. And they have almost no proof. They don't know how far this mortgage fraud goes. And I, I imagine it goes enormously far. And I bet you uh, that uh, the wisdom of Solomon could not figure out who actually owns a house in America anymore because it's been so split up and diversified and sold all over the planet. But now what they're saying is they're going to shake these banks down, the five or six major banks who defrauded the U.S. government, defrauded the customers and lied about the, at least according to the allegations, lied about the quality of these investments to investors all around the world, that they're going to get let off with $30 billion. People say, well, that's a lot of money. But it doesn't come out of the pockets of the people. There's 1.5 quadrillion in derivatives. Bank of America is taking houses they never even had a deed to that are paid for with people that have pure title going back decades. It is, it is in the thousands of trillions. And yeah, they're telling the big banks, government's going to guarantee all this if you put 30 billion in with the big six banks. That doesn't even come to 200, 300 billion. It, it, it isn't even near 1 trillion. And, and then, but the public hears 30 billion. That sounds big. You're absolutely right, Stefan Molyneux. Let's go to some calls. I'm skipping this network break. And I want to go five minutes into overdrives. So we get to Beth, Michael, Brian, Sean, George, and others. You're on the air, uh, Beth, from Texas with Alex Jones and Stefan Molyneux. Welcome. Hi, Alex. Um, what my question is, is I'm wondering with, um, I've bought some gold and silver, and what I'm wondering is, is that um, are we ripe for confiscation or will they do it in another way, basically through taxation? Um, right now, if I sell some of the gold and silver I have, there's a 28% capital gain. Well, people do that under I the, yeah, I mean, I'm not telling you what to do, but folks, that's why gold's really good because it's hard to track. Look, here's the deal. People say, why should I own gold? They could take it. Well, why should I have children? They could die in a car wreck or, you know, die of cancer. God forbid they don't, but I'm not out of fear, not going to live. Gold and silver aren't perfect. And yes, I believe down the road they're going to try to slap taxes on. They're going to try to, to take it. But it's better than them just taking it through inflation or taking it right out of your bank account. It's harder for them to get. Do like my, my grandmother's father and my grandfather's father, both of them, different parts of Texas, didn't turn their gold in when the Fed said do it in 33. And so it comes down to the end of the day saying, I'm not doing what you tell me, crooks. And if enough of us do it, they can't enforce on us. What do you say to that, Stefan Molyneux? Well, I think that's right, and I also think that it's well worthwhile buying stuff at the moment with your fiat currency that, that can't be taken, right? So buy a bunch of food, buy some water, you know, stock up a little bit. Even if you don't think there's going to be a huge collapse, there's sure as heck going to be massive inflation in food prices over the next year. So that's a great way. I mean, they're not going to come and take cans from your basement, so you can convert your fiat currency into something you can eat, something you can use, grow a vegetable garden, do all of that kind of good stuff, unless you want to be arrested like some people are for growing vegetable gardens. But yeah, you can convert Al-Qaeda gardens. Uh, Al-Qaeda Gardens, the terrorist tomato is loose in the neighborhood. Oh, no, <laughs> run, run! Ah! <laughs>
That's right. <laughs> the vegetables are coming. Flee! She's Get facing 90 days in jail for a tomato plant in yeah. her yard, yeah. Yeah, very sad. Yeah, so that that would be my suggestion. Try Beth, and get does that answer your? Yeah, I mean, I mean Beth, yeah. Beth, does that answer? Beth, you can go in little coin shops and places, swap meets. You can buy gold and silver here and there. You can buy it from companies like Midas. I, I mean, I mean, so what? So, I mean, the crooks may announce tomorrow we've all got to be drafted to fight for Emperor Bumblebee or whoever's in power. Then, I mean, at the end of the, they may nuke Chicago and say the Easter Bunny did it. And uh, I mean, there's no telling what they'll do to try to make you love them through fear. And uh, you just got to get the word out that they're the terrorists. They stage 9-11. And if you don't do that, they're going to keep staging terror attacks. That's their... How do you deal with government staging crises or wars as a pretext to make people primitively rally around the king, uh, New World Order person? Stefan. Well, I think all you have to do is point out the number of times that these things have occurred before. I mean, it's well established now that the, um, the Gulf of Tomkin incident was staged and fabricated and that started a war that killed millions of people. Everybody's completely aware about the lies about the WMDs in both the British and American press. And isn't it shocking that the news of the world is shut down because they hacked a few cell phones. The fact that they supported a war that's killed over a million people and driven million, millions more into exile, that didn't get them shut down. Well, this is political fighting. This yeah. is Soros str striking at uh, Murdoch. You know, these globalists even get in little fights with each other. Yeah, that's true. They're the turf wars like the five families in, in New York. They're just turf wars, and we think that it's got something to do with our freedom, but it's just them battling over our tax revenue, which is really quite sad. Absolutely. I mean, this uh, well said. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you, Beth. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I want to just say I'm not with Stefan Molyneux. I agree that up in Michigan and in other areas where they're arresting people for, uh, for growing tomatoes uh, in their yard, I think that's reasonable. And that's what George Washington fought for. I'm not with the extremist, okay? Right. Well, you know, he obviously cut down the cherry tree because you don't want to eat cherries. He, you know, he understood that the, the war really yes. needs to be against fruits and vegetables. So I think that's why he chopped down that tree. And I think we're all with him on that. Stefan, you are really starting to get it. <laughs> You're I really am. You're not an extremist now. Good. I, I feel like I'm not being dragged behind the train of Alex Jones. I'm actually clambering on the caboose and, and starting to walk up. And that feels good. I no, no, I think you're on your own train and... way up ahead of me there, my <laughs> friend. You can't do Darth Vader yet, but we'll get you there. Michael uh, in Florida, you're on the air with an evil person. Go ahead. Oh, Michelle. Uh, Michelle. I got to read that better. Michelle, welcome. Hi, Alex. Hi, Stefan. Um, mine isn't so much of a question as it's I wanted both your thoughts on this. Um, you've been talking about for the past few weeks a possible false flag, maybe in America or in Europe, with Gaddafi. But well, they would never do that. I mean, they shipped 30,000 guns to blame it on the Second Amendment into Mexico, and they wouldn't have perjured themselves. They would never stage a terror attack. I'm sorry, ma'am. Go ahead. Well, that's okay. <laughs> but my, my thought was, um, I know that we're the resistance and a lot of the Christian people, but they're have, supposed to be having this big summit in, in Washington, the CUFI, in July 18th through 20th, I thought. But anyway, is it too far out there to think, because Glenn Beck's supposed to be there, and you just said they're going to blame it on Glenn Beck. Do you think it's possible that they they would try a false flag. I mean, with thousands of well, let's not give them any. Let's not give them any idea. But yeah, they're all scaring us about the caliphate and Muslim extremists, and then publicly funding all the groups in every case and funding uh, Al Qaeda right now against against Gaddafi. I mean, I'm not saying some of these groups aren't out of control and dangerous. The point is, who fed that dog? Who trained that dog? And uh, absolutely, false flag is the next card they're going to pull. You better believe it. You can see all the prepping and priming and Jim Jones Kool-Aid drills where they're telling us, when the terrorists attack, what do you do? Give our rights up to you. What do you do when the terrorists attack? Bend over and give you my bank account. What do you do when the terrorists attack? Let you grope our five-year-olds. What do you do when we stage the terror attack? Worship you. You're our daddy. Uh, thank you for the call, uh, Michelle. I'm going to go to Brian, Sean, George Lee. The show's about to end. We'll have internet only for five minutes if Stefan can do it to finish those calls. Your comments okay. on what I just said, Stefan Molyneux. Well, you can see this happening already, Alex. I mean, they've cut hundreds of millions of dollars in military funding to Pakistan, which is going to destabilize the ruling governments. People don't understand, many people don't understand the degree to which tyrannies around the world are supported by Western money for a variety of nasty and evil reasons. So there's going to be destabilization in Pakistan, uh, and that, of course, is going to be pretext for another intervention and more control and more growth. So you just keep need to exploding this stuff ahead of time. Put the predictions out there and try and be as right as possible, and that's going to gain you credibility with anybody who 
who's got a few brain cells left rolling around. Well, they caught the CIA guy trying to give nuke material to Al-Qaeda to then blame it on the Pakistan government publicly two months ago. They're not playing games. They're getting that little ledger, that history ready when they blow up Chicago. They've already bought the properties they want to blow up. Uh, let's go ahead and talk to Brian uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, Alex. Hello, sir. Hey, uh, just sitting here with my my 14 year old daughter, working on getting her woken up. And uh, thanks for waking me up because uh, I passed on a favor to a number of uh, my friends, and they're getting the idea. But uh, I had an idea. You're talking about Ron Paul, and uh, I had a couple of campaign slogans for Dr. Paul. You want to hear them? Uh, yes, yes. Tell us the extremist. <laughs> go ahead. They're, they're adaptations. The first one is Paul and no Fed. Okay. And, uh, the, the second one is, uh, it's the Federal Reserve, stupid. I agree. Ooh, I'm going to do a T-shirt of that. I'm stealing that. It's the Federal Reserve, stupid. Beautiful. All right. Glad you like it. And, you know, if he would just get up there while he's got a platform on the debates, he just start saying to the American people, did you know that the Federal Reserve is owned by Rockefeller, Rothschild, Warburg? No, no, I, I agree. Ron Paul's great, but if he got a lot more hardcore... Uh, then that would have a bigger effect. And maybe we can uh, give Ron Paul some Red Bull before he gets up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, just want to say... Maybe we can waterboard Ron, Ron Paul with coffee. Starbucks coffee. For no, the guy's 75 years old, works all day long, and he's a gentleman. Uh, and listen, I got to go. I, I, Stefan Molyneux, the main radio show's over, but I'm going to do five more minutes into Overdrive sure. Internet Only at InfoWars.com to talk to Sean, George, and Lee. Quick questions for Stefan Molyneux. I'm Alex Jones. We'll see you back tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central. Spread the word. Evil to Stefan Molyneux. We only got five minutes left right now. Uh, let's talk to Sean in Wyoming. Sean, go ahead. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I just want to say um, thank you for waking me up. I'm, an, I'm honored to be on your show. And I speak for the majority of the American people when I say we're sick of it. I'm tired of this. Ah! Testify, brother. Everything, everything that uh, is controlled. I mean, let me give you a little background on myself. I, I, I'm going to college this fall to be a personal trainer slash physical education teacher. And I've been trying to get food that is good for me. And I, it's not nowhere to be found. Not Al Qaeda farms tomatoes. Around, oh, yeah. The farms around America is... Stefan, we got another one of these people doesn't want to eat GMO. Yep, yeah, I don't want to eat GMO. I don't want to eat none of that. I, I, I shot the natural grocers. They claim they, they claim to be grass fed beef. I don't even know if it really is. It's Terrorist. A, a core, a core, I don't give a sh. Okay, I appreciate your call. I understand your anger, Stefan. It's good that folks are getting angry because that's the first step in getting woken up. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the fight or flight mechanism, if we can tamp down the flight and focus on the fight, I think that's a, that's a good use of adrenaline these days. Well done, Lord Malano. Let's go ahead and talk to uh, George in Connecticut. You're on the air, my friend. Good to speak to you again. Um, I heard uh, some people talking over on a Sunday show on WABC in New York uh, area coming into my state, Connecticut. Ah. And I couldn't believe it. It almost sounded like your hardcore show. I mean, you're you're bleeding over to a lot of different networks. You're, you're beating their tail off. Now they can no longer keep it quiet. It's, you know, I think it's more than that. People have been managed in the narrative of the little tight left-right box that that, that 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 the social engineers like Curl quickly wrote about. Once I don't show people the truth, I show folks there's a bigger world, and get them to take their own blinders off, and then and then they see it. Stefan comments. Well, if you put something in someone's food that continually makes them fat, you know, like corn syrup or whatever, this sort of stuff, then you, they may not believe you for a while because it's like, oh, this tastes good. I like it. But eventually when they look down and they can't see, let's say, their toes, for want of a better word, if they look down and they can't see their toes because their gut is so big, at that point, they may believe you, uh, because if you don't believe the reason and the arguments and the evidence ahead of time, you then have to accept the evidence after the fact. And the fact that the system is breaking down so badly is proof that it's immoral at its core. And so people who didn't accept the moral arguments now are seeing the terrible effects right. of violence. And that's, uh, I think, enough to, to shore up our moral arguments. I want to get one last caller in, but George, what were they talking about on WABC? 
Oh, they were talking everything from the Federal Reserve to uh, uh, the, the way of being raped and how, how they're going to be raping Social Security. I, I heard it on several different shows. The ABC was the biggest because they were one of the biggest networks. Uh, no, I know. WABC. Appreciate the call. Uh, let's talk to Lee in Minnesota. You'll be our tail gunner with Stefan Molyneux today. Go ahead. Hit us and hit us hard. Alex, uh, Stephen, I, I would like to ask uh, both of you uh, quickly today, and maybe you could get into this more, Alex, uh, tomorrow or the next day, about particularly what uh, they're talking about with the 14th Amendment, because I believe, uh, I believe, Stephen, that uh, Stephon. Things, are, uh, Stephon, things are already dead and that they will invoke this uh, uh, this clause, what, from 1868? Yeah, I saw this weird, creepy, he's going to be like Abraham Lincoln, you watch stuff, even in the campaign, and, and they're, they're now trying to invoke it. Uh, uh, I appreciate your call. Stephen Molyneux, what do you think of that? Okay, remind me about the 14th Amendment. Well, I'm I mean, sorry, they're now announcing the president can basically be a dictator. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, what do you mean can be a dictator? He's already been a dictator for quite some time. I mean, uh, there was somebody who asked Nancy Pelosi, some reporter asked Nancy Pelosi prior to Obamacare, he said, what uh, aspect of the Constitution allows the federal government to, to mandate health insurance for Americans? And she just looked at him like he was speaking Martian out of his armpit, because it's like, <laughs> what the earth would the Constitution have to do with anything? Uh, we're out of time, Stefan, but I want to go out here with you with a war growl. Let's stop the flight. Let's get the fight going. Do it with me on three. One, two, three. Ah! Cut back to him. Yeah. Well, let's give us another one. I want to see you. Ah, come on, step on. <laughs> Wake up, folks. Wake up. Fight back. See you back tomorrow live. Spread the word about the transmission. Thank you, Stephen. Great job, crew. Where can you find us?